Assalamu alaikum. May God peace and blessing be upon you all, dear friends. We are delighted to have today with us a, a special guest, Dr. Craig Considine, who is a, a scholar and a, a writer of many books and articles on Christian and Muslim relations. Uh, and uh, a well uh, known global speaker. Sorry, what's so this? Technical problems. Okay. And uh, a young father to a beautiful girl. So it, it, it's very hard to, to, to express all to our beautiful people. But I mean, a specific is that you are the young daddy. So welcome, Dr. Craig, and uh, thank you very much that you accept your, our invitation. Thank you. Uh, first, let me say that I, I really enjoy reading your book, uh, The Humanity of Muhammad a Christian View. Uh, I was curious to know the opinion of Christian scholar uh, regarding the uh, the life of uh, Prophet Muhammad. And uh, but before starting reading your book, I find the title very impressive. So, as human beings, we we are living in a world surrounded by walls, prejudice, different barriers divide us. Uh, most of the time we forget that we are brothers and sisters in humanity and we have and share a lot of things as a common, as a part of big family. So I'm interested to know what uh, were your thoughts and motivation to write a book for Prophet Muhammad and to choose this specific title for the book. Skender, thank you so much, and uh, Genti as well for reaching out and organizing this event. I just want to say thank you to Bader University and greetings of peace to you all who are joining today. So the motivation behind the book, I think, has many layers to it. I don't think there's one motivation. I do think number one that stands out is my appreciation for Skender, what you were kind of talking about, this idea of like a big family and, and humanity, you know, and, and that sense of kind of love and connection that is possible between people. I very much love that. And I would love to see more of that in the world. And, you know, that is ultimately humanity. For me, that's also what makes a good Christian. It's what makes a good American citizen. It's what makes a good human being. Then as a kind of scholar, if you want to put it that way, or someone who is interested in knowledge and philosophy, when I began reading about Prophet Muhammad's life, I became inspired because I was very much seeing kind of my own reflection, if I could put it that way, very much seeing my principles, the things that I stand for and my desires um, as a human being working for the betterment of our world, I saw that in his life and legacy. So it's a combination, I think, in many ways of being inspired for this kind of love of humanity, this big family, this connectedness, and also the love of knowledge, the love of knowledge, not in the sense specifically of texts, and peer-reviewed journal articles, which is very important. But when we talk about knowledge, there's a different type of knowledge too. And that, that comes with human dynamics and human interactions. So this is what kind of triggers me, I guess, or not triggers isn't the right word. These are the things that really make me go. It's what kind of lights a fire inside of me. And it's ultimately, it just so happens that Muhammad stood for the same things. And when I see something that I agree with, I'll say it. I agree with this person, even though he's not part of my faith. That's okay. Yeah, absolutely. You're right. So uh, uh, we know that in, in less decades, uh, uh, there are, we saw a lot of attempts to establish dialogue platforms between Muslims and Christians. But still, there is an, a reluctance on common believers. I mean, regarding those approaches, a strange fear that we are betraying the faith. Uh, the most, most, of the, most of the people are, are not willing to participate in active interfaith dialogue engagement. What, what can you say to those people, to Muslim and Christians, 
believers regarding the importance of interfaith dialogue and tolerance based on the teaching of Prophet Muhammad and Prophet Jesus. So according to your perspective, uh, based on your, on your last book. It's unfortunate that there is a fear of encountering the other. There is a fear that things between groups will blend so much that a new identity forms and all the differences wither away. And I feel like that is a difficult thing for people to digest. They don't want to change. They don't want to see the light at the end of the tunnel necessarily. And this fear as linked to kind of feeling like you, if you engage in a dialogue or an encounter that you're betraying your faith for Christians and Muslims in the modern sense, that's just not necessarily accurate. I don't know how else to put that, but let me just say this. There are so many examples at the very origins of Christianity and at the very origins of Islam that explicitly show that dialogue is inherently part of both traditions. And even better, that dialogue between Islam and Christianity, between Christians and Muslims, is also a historical fact if we're going to accept the, the sources. So this gets to the heart of the very kind of meaning of Christian and Muslim identity in many ways. We have multiple examples from Prophet Muhammad's life specifically of him not just engaging in dialogue, broadly speaking, but in engaging in a Christian Muslim dialogue. Of course, we have the kind of classic example would be in 630 with the diplomatic visit of the Christians of, Nud of Nudron to Masjid al-Nabawi. They have a dialogue on Christology. The Christians are able to pray in the Masjid and a covenant came out of it, an agreement. Uh, and that is, you know, well sourced and well accepted in the, the body of knowledge. Uh, I also think that we go to the first hijra and something beyond dialogue actually happened. It wasn't just dialogue. It was what I refer to as allyship. And we have the believers fleeing Mecca, being persecuted, cross the Red Sea, go to a foreign land, have no idea how they're really going to be treated, even though Muhammad told the believers you will be treated well because there's a Christian king there and he is just. They go there seeking asylum. They enter into a dialogue in the court of Christian King Ibn Abjar. They talk about Surah Maryam and talk about Quranic verses on Jesus. So the dialogue was there. But the best part of this story is that the Christian king of uh, Abyssinia, was I saying Nadron? I meant Abyssinia, sorry. Abyssinia. I meant Abyssinia. Um, that the Christian king of Abyssinia defended the believers in front of the Quraysh in his own court, and he refused to hand them over, which is the kind of highest point of dialogue when you become so kind of intertwined that you're willing to defend another group of people. So we have two important lessons here um, for, for Christians with the example of the Christians of Nudron, you know, go, leave your home, go and engage in a dialogue in a land that is dominated predominantly by Muslims, enter their mosque, see what it's like. And with the Christians of Abyssinia, for Christians being good hosts, being hospitable people. Uh, so I find these stories just as inspiring, kind of not as someone who admires Muhammad, but I'm also quite happy with Christians who acted, I think, in the spirit of Jesus in both of these historical cases. Absolutely right. So, and I also myself, I participate to a lot of the interfaith dialogue uh, conferences, seminars, and uh, to, uh, when we see it, uh, regarding the devoted people, uh, I understand that uh, it can be subjective, but I want to share an interesting experience that I, I had in a, in a conference that stand two or three days. And in the third day, the people get to know each other together and they, they speak more sincerely and freely. I had a, a, an imam and, the, and, the, and the priest that used to know each other for a long time. And they say that we, we pray for each other. And they say, tell me what you pray for. And 
The Imam said, I, I pray that my dear friends Christ to be a Muslim. And the Christ said, I pray, I pray for my dear friend Imam to be the Catholic. So yeah, it, it is something that uh, we have to be sincere when, when we wish and we pray is different, but when we engage in dialogue, we, we accept the others as they are in their places and try to know them and, uh, and try to share what we have in, in common with, with both the respects. So this is the, this is also idea, but uh, nowadays in, in some places, we, the presence of ignorance, let's say in society, uh, stimulates hate and prejudice and racism and even to discrimination. I believe that the ignorance is, is the main enemy of, of, of humanity and civilization, but if, and also we agree that the, the purpose of strategy to fight ignorance is, is sort of the value-based education and, and rightful knowledge. But, uh, but uh, Craig, uh, can you explain me your understanding and thoughts regarding the place and value that knowledge and I'd say wisdom having in the teaching of Prophet Muhammad uh, uh, with your references uh, in the last book? Yeah, I mentioned this quite early in the book. I dedicate a whole section to ilm, the Arabic term for seeking knowledge. And thankfully, when I was about 19 or 20 years old, I entered into a classroom having no knowledge of Islam outside of the media was showing me. And Akbar Ahmed, at the beginning of class, just started talking about the of uh, knowledge seeking knowledge in the islamic tradition at large islamic civilization and he started sharing various hadith of prophet muhammad you know the ink of the scholar is more sacred than the blood of the martyr seek knowledge even if it's as far as china and for me these really shook me to my core and i think that's the actual term i use in the book it shook me to my core because it busted the stereotype of I had of Islam, but it also shook me to my core because the purity and the importance of knowledge was understood to me kind of right then and there. And I thought to myself, my brain and my heart have kind of been hijacked by ignorance, that they've been warped in a way, that they, these aren't really my views. The, I didn't come to understand these views or beliefs on my own. They were fed to me. And I almost took it personally that I was kind of duped by Islamophobia or anti-Muslim sentiment. So I became passionate about knowledge, which led to my exploration of Muhammad's emphasis on knowledge. And I'm going to go back to the point that I made in the previous question about what is kind of knowledge and how might Prophet Muhammad look at that. I think certainly he would have a respect for experts, the scholars, the people who are devoting their life uh, and their resources and their energy and their time to the study of texts and, and rationality and complex theories. But I also believe he would see knowledge as really something that comes out of the culture of encounter, if I could say that. This, this idea of uh, cross-cultural navigation or being a cross-cultural navigator, someone who is willing to experience different cultures. Like, what can that do for you? that can give you an immense amount of knowledge. I really can't put into words what traveling and meeting people around the world has done for me. It's, 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 you can't put it into words. And I think Muhammad was ingrained in this cross-cultural navigation very early on in his life. He saw a lot more diversity in culture and religion and, and thought, then I think a lot of people realize. If you go back into the history and understand the Arabian Peninsula in the late sixth and early seventh century, you'll know that this is a pretty metropolitan, like kind of diverse. It was culturally diverse. And I think his travels and journeys on the trading caravans opened his eyes up to the world. And he understood the complexity of that world. And that is knowledge in itself. Absolutely, yeah. Also, uh, know that uh, as a human beings, we are all in search of a meaning. So we want to understand our existence and uh, why we are in this world. So from, from the beginning of history, and 
also we, we, we have to seek for knowledge otherwise without knowing uh, we cannot find the answer so it's, it's uh, seeking knowledge is something that you really a continuous uh, process during all the life uh, also because uh, in the Quran is mentioned that people that they they are uh, scholars uh, they are alims they say they they fear more the God and the, they are more respectful and also uh, they are more conscious regarding the problems and the needs of society and also they they have get a contribution so uh, even our, our first uh, uh, revolution was Iqra, read so uh, to the Muslim so is obligatory uh, seeking the, the, the knowledge but uh, I, I want also to, to share that nowadays uh, in many places uh, on the world we see uh, uh, Muslim and Christians and other believers of different religions that are facing some problems regarding religious freedom and right to, to live the, uh, and to express their religion in, in daily lives. Uh, referring to those topics, uh, uh, you made a relation with, uh, in your book uh, between a, a civic nation state, I, I mean, a, as a concept based on uh, and quality between citizens with common goals and values with the Prophet Muhammad's vision for Ummah. Uh, so in this uh, perspective, what would be your message, your suggestion to Muslim uh, and Christian religious and political leadership regarding the importance of religious freedom and religious pluralism with uh, references of, uh, to Prophet Muhammad and Prophet Jesus' teachings? So, Skender, this issue of the civic nation, the term itself, I think, is really one of the most important political ideas, if I could use that term, a political idea in the world today. And the world is getting increasingly diverse. I think in many ways we live in increasingly diverse societies. The world is becoming more interconnected and more globalized, if you want to say that. I mean, it's like there's no end in sight to the blending of, of all of us, of humanity. And it's not, to use the classic American term, it's not common sense yeah. to adopt a vision of a nation that is rooted in supremacy. And this supremacy could be religious, it could be racial, it could be ethnic, it could be cultural, it could be a combination of all of these things. It could be ethno-religious, it could be racial religious. And it's just not feasible. It creates, in, in many ways, a cloud over the nation. And you have minorities feeling as if there is no possibility to belong because they don't have the requisites. They weren't born with the right skin color or they don't have the right religion. This is very, very dangerous. And it's a affront to human rights. You know, the civic nation enables human rights. The civic nation provides constitutional rights. So when we talk about a civic nation, we talk about the rule of law. We talk about, it's not merely democracy, but it's the establishment of things like freedom of religion, freedom of worship, freedom of speech, freedom of conscience, the right to own property, the freedom to a fair trial. You know, some of these issues that play in, out in the governmental realm, that's really the best of what America is in theory. That's what America should be in the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution. Now, when you take that civic nation theory and you kind of elevate it and put it on a pedestal, which I believe we should, and then you go to Prophet Muhammad's example with the second Hijra in 622. So Prophet Muhammad goes to Yathrib as someone who, and Yathrib later, later becomes Medina, Yathrib is a society relatively diverse in religion and ethnicity and tribe, feuding over generations, dealing with conflicts that put up walls and barriers and that led to violence. So Muhammad comes in as a mediator. And you can imagine as a mediator, as this kind of neutral figure, 
just thinking about human rights and justice and brings the tribes to the table and says, okay, how are we really going to fix this? We can't have any semblance anymore of supremacy, of this kind of we're part of this tribe, so we're better, or you're not this religion, therefore you can't participate in governance. There, there was none of that. It was very much a, the constitution of Medina, it very much enabled a republic. And I, I don't think people realize this. Like in, in some ways, the United States is a republic, right? You have 50 states and territories that are all tied to, you know, there's sovereignty amongst the states in the constitution of Medina, it would have been the tribes. So these tribes have sovereignty, yet they're tied back to a political document or a city. In the case of the United States, it's Washington, DC. And the constitution of Medina united these warring tribes, not only in the constitutional principles, giving everyone the same freedoms, but it also made the groups mutually dependent upon one another. So if one tribe or state was attacked, then the whole entity would defend that state. That's ultimately what the United States is. Yeah. So there's different ways of looking at the civic nation too. You could look at it largely through kind of political rights, but then you could also look at it at a government uh, and governance level, which is quite interesting in light of like a republic. Yeah, absolutely. So it's, it's a... Uh, even when, when we see that in the time of, of the Medina, the Prophet Muhammad, the, 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 the arrangement as a, I mean, the, the, like the Republic, it was also uh, uh, people with different religious backgrounds and they see they feel the part of, the, of that, let's say, the state. And this is also, uh, uh, for the time, was very challenging. So uh, no, nowadays, for example, we, we, uh, many emig Muslim immigrants in Europe and maybe in some Western countries, uh, they, they face difficulties regarding integration and their a crash of their identities because in, in one place as a Muslim and other as a part of that nation. So, but when we uh, think about civic uh, state nation, we, they feel as active citizens. So also we are part with my identity and I contribute to, to, to the nation and I, I am not alienated. So I am part of this with full right as, a, as a, a equal to the others. Uh, but you know that in less decades, the, the, the social image of Muslims in, in media was, was not good. So uh, you know that some related to violent extremism and, and other factors that uh, a lot of people, uh, they relate, for example, the violent religious extremism to access of religion. But to my experience, I see more related to lack of humanity than access of religion. And, uh, also, in your book, you mentioned that the Prophet Muhammad's engagement with humanity can serve as a, as a tool to, to, to counter uh, this extremism. And uh, 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 can you uh, elaborate uh, a little bit more this whole the, 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 this tool of humanity of, uh, or for Prophet Muhammad's teaching can, can serve as a, uh, as a tool to, to counter uh, uh, extremism? Good. Uh, it's a good question. Um, I would let me start with the civic nation. I think the civic nation is a good point to also start in combating any form of extremism because it doesn't give one racial group, religious group, or ethnic group kind of supreme control over the state. And I think that in in many ways um, is good for a society. In terms of combating extremism, I do think extremism is largely fueled by hate, which is really a ramification of ignorance and lack of exposure to the very thing that you're talking about. Um, and when we look at how Prophet Muhammad approached something like religious pluralism or any type of energetic engagement with fellow human beings, we can see the antidote to extremism. So instead of merely watching the news coverage of a given subject and developing opinions that way, uh, Prophet Muhammad would probably say, hey, before you make your judgment, it's probably best if you go actually interact with these people and you know, break bread with these people, 
show hospitality to these people, try to figure out a way to work together with these people. I think there's countless examples in Prophet Muhammad's life where he genuinely appreciated and understood the value of human interaction, like and, and genuine human interaction um, as well. And then I also think when we talk about extremism, perhaps in the context of Western society, we see an issue developing with uh, race. I feel like the, the West is, is struggling with this race issue in many ways, particularly America. And much of these racial divisions are fueled by a sense of racial supremacy, which is a pretty large abstract topic. But when we talk about extremism, we have to talk about supremacy in terms of race. And Muhammad's views on racial equality serve as a very nice antidote to extremism that pops up because of racial superiority. We know that Muhammad had to be someone who advocated for racial equality because these were messages given to him through revelation. The Quran fundamentally is a book that, you know, not, doesn't only recognize humanity, but like embraces humanity. You know, we made you into nations and, and tribes so you can get to know one another. Yeah, this is... So, and, and that goes back to my, you know, so you can get to know one another. That goes back to the point that I made with pluralism. And then that's also part of the civic nation, right? Because everyone can be part of a civic nation. Not everyone can be part of the ethnic nation. So really, I think what we're talking about is the common theme of just being active and getting to know people. It sounds really overly simplistic, but like maybe that's the point is to keep it simple. Yeah, but you're right. It seems simple as an action, but it's very important and not easy to take over. So uh, uh, it is hard. It, 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 you need investment and also you... Uh, trying to understand the others and to make uh, connection and bridges and to uh, to to approach them sincerely this is a good way of speaking open the heart and try to know and uh, try to understand and make some empathy so uh, this is very important so if you care from others uh, you know that there is an, a the golden rule between uh, abrahamic religions uh, some very some specific rules regarding caring the other people's and neighbors and uh, be humanistic. So it is very important when we put uh, those rules on our joint vision together. And also we will care more about the other problems that are in the world. So it's, it is very important. Uh, even uh, as you mentioned, well, uh, uh, prophet, uh, one of the main prophet Muhammad teaching was people are, are equal in front of the God. So your deeds, your commands matter. So not your nationality, not your color, etc. So this is a strong message in the time that uh, to all of us, because we, we are not uh, uh, in front of others, but what we make us different is our humanity or this or relation, etc. So I have an, uh, some question from, from streaming Facebook. So I have to ask because I have to select. Uh, uh, one is what was very interesting. So I, I put uh, uh, writing such a book, they say that and your peaceful and balanced approach to both faiths has made you more uh, lovable to the audience or audience is more skeptical of you. So uh, maybe it's direct to the uh, to, to one uh, thing that you mentioned in this book, why this Christian is, is an Islamic apologist. So uh, it, uh, probably it's, uh, it's very, you faced a lot of specific questions to you during your Oh, seminars and, uh, and public speakers, but this is interesting to know. Yeah, and it's um, a little bit of both, if I could say that. It's a little bit of the goodness and a little bit of the skepticism and the criticism. On the good side, I will say that people see the book for what it is in regards to my intention. So my intention is really important and people often don't really probably understand it. My intention with this book is to share the knowledge that I have because I think that it's valuable. And it's also a kind of labor of love and appreciation for not only Muhammad, but for Islam and for Muslims, which over the years 
has enriched my life, enriched my faith, improved my understanding, I think, of Christianity and of God. Uh, so in this way, it's good to see other people kind of seeing eye to eye with me and understanding like this is, this is who you are. What you wrote in this book is who you are. And it's like, yes, this is, I believe in what I write. I believe in what I say. So to those people who understand my intention and understand my goals and my spirit of enhancing knowledge, building bridges of understanding, I say, thank you. And to the skeptics, there's a lot of different kind of, I think there's differences between criticisms and like allegations. So a criticism would be that my writing suggests that the differences between Christianity and Islam or Jesus and Muhammad are quite small, which I agree with. And academics may criticize that. And that's fair play. You know, that's part of the academic game, if you want to call it that. And I consider that part of the intellectual discussion. The skeptical side that is linked to the allegations are a little bit more kind of far-fetched, you know, saying that I'm a hired gun, basically, that I'm working on behalf of governments, that I'm working on behalf of movements, that I'm paid a ridiculous sum of money to write these things. I think those are unfair. I think that's largely due to ignorance, not knowing who I really am, not listening to what I say, what I post, what I write. I would hope that the people who are more approving understand that this is genuine. Um, I think the people who are approving understand that, but the people who are skeptical for some reason have their own interpretations of who I am and what I'm trying to do. And that's unfortunate, but what am I, what am I supposed to do? You know, I'm, I'm not going to stop. I'm going to keep journeying on this road that I'm on, which I think is a good road. Yeah, absolutely. And that's it. It's just part of the, the skepticism. It's part of the game. Yeah. It's, it's, uh, I, I understand this, uh, your approach regarding this because when it comes to me as a Muslim, as, as I mentioned in, in first, uh, at the first of our talk, it's very important for me to, to understand the, the, the perspective of the approach of, of Christian scholars and other scholars regarding my faith. And also, for, I, I find very sincere when they share uh, they post their ideas with us because uh, it is also a, a motivation factor to, to join in the humanity and to join the, uh, in the common good of society. So beyond, the, I think, uh, when it comes to sincere believers, uh, more than tolerating each other, it means uh, I am different, you are different, we stay in, in the different places. I think we have to care more for our well-being. So if you are good and you, you, are, you have the inner spiritual stability and your well-being is important. So I have to do something that you have to feel better to be good, both spiritually, both uh, in different ways. So it goes beyond the tolerance. And, yeah. uh, and I want to give a, a, an example from my country, Albania. It, it faced the most uh, extreme communism in, in Western Balkans and that the, uh, believing God was forbidden by law. So how you can forbid uh, people to believe in God, but uh, they find the strength to believe because Believing is, is, is hope for the future and also caring uh, for others. So also these believers in religions have the responsibility regarding the, the, the future and regarding uh, uh, educating the young generation. But also we, we fail to some extent to integrate those topics and those strategies in our education model. So I, I think education based on such values for the, uh, even in the beginning, not in a university on, uh, and different centers, but how we can integrate those values in, in, in our education and how we can teach our kids, our young generation about the importance of, of uh, uh, harmony and respect of each other and uh, what should be our strategy regarding those topics. Well, this is a really important subject. 
integration, education, inclusion, senses of belonging, how do we develop these issues? And I want to keep it simple here, and I'm going to go back to the importance of human interaction, which becomes even more important when you talk about the youth. Um, and I think if we start educating the youth through experience, experiential learning, I think things stick more with experiential learning. I don't have the data to back this up necessarily, and perhaps this is my own bias, but I know for me, when I experience a theory, if I could say that, to experience a theory, to experience something that happens in real time that connects me to a kind of broader concept, a sociological concept, it connects with me. And if we're just teaching our youth something that's coming out of a book, not that that's bad, but it's not enough. I think for it to truly make sense for people, you have to involve some type of physical activity. And I'm not talking about running sprints or having a gym class. I'm talking about going to a center, having a center come to you, engaging with other religious communities or whatever communities it might be, cultural communities through civic engagement, through charitable endeavors, finding ways to make people more human, to make people more human, you know, do things that all human beings do together. So I think that this is the number one place to begin, really to emphasize the real-time events, the real-time experiences. So instead of just talking about charity in Christianity and in Islam, in an interfaith dialogue session, which is important, do that and then go out and do it, live it together. I think that's what makes the biggest impact. Yes, it's, it's important. Live it in society and be a positive example from the young generation with, with practicing and not, not all, uh, and just in theory and just to some people, but just you hit to spread to, to society. So, uh, to Muslims, you know that after one week, and maybe we are going to, to Ramadan, you know, the Ramadan Kareem, we are going to, to fast and uh, to enter the different spiritual months uh, from the Muslims because. Uh, Fasting uh, in, in this epidemic uh, time, I don't know how we, how we do without iftars and without gatherings together, etc. So uh, I, I know that you are very familiar with activities and uh, very engaged in your society and uh, uh, with different engagement with Muslims and uh, other uh, religious believers. But uh, do you have any, I mean, uh, and a different experience uh, uh, because uh, when you see in the first look, you see very familiar, you know that, and we uh, and part of the group and society. Do we have any different experience with uh, compared to engagement with dialogue with Muslims that uh, stay in your mind and you put, uh, put you a different, I mean, impression uh, in, in U.S. I mean, in your living country. So, are you asking about kind of my my experiences? With, yeah, yeah with Muslims? Uh, different experiences with. Yeah. Uh, uh, it, engaging it's, with Muslims, uh, cooperation engagements. Yeah, it's been, um, it really started in 2008 for me when I was part of Professor Akbar Ahmed's Journey into America project, which was a ethnography, a year long ethnography. And we went throughout the United States, we went to over a uh, hundred mosques. And we were answering the question, what does it mean to be an American through the lens of Muslims? Yeah. And this was in 2008. To answer that question, we also had to spend time with a diverse range of groups in America, the neighbors of Muslims, to understand what the perception was. So that opened me up not only to the kind of representation of the Ummah in the United States, which... Uh, Skender, as you know, the U.S. Muslim population is one of the most diverse in the world. Really, you have the entirety, what it feels like the entirety of the Ummah represented here. And it also, this journey into America taught me so much about my own country. So I've been blessed really to spend time with and engage with a range of groups 
And I think overwhelmingly it has been a experience rooted in first and foremost hospitality. I think um, hospitality really stands out to me, not only in masjids, but also people inviting, you know, my family to their homes, to private events, which add a kind of deeper level of authenticity and connection. And Ramadan and the iftars are something that I wish Christianity had ingrained as much uh, as Islam does. Um, and I've, I've definitely adopted fasting, by the way, as actually a key point, not of just my, my Christian identity, just as me as a human. I fast quite often, actually. And thanks to Ramadan, really, for introducing that. So the, the experience is um, currently in, in Houston. I've engaged a lot with Islam and Spanish, which is a community that is uh, quite diverse, largely made up of um, Hispanic folks, but it's a growing community doing incredible work, really engaging with community at large. And really, I mean, there's countless yeah. organizations around the country that I've been able to, to work with. So it's that in itself is a representation of humanity. You know, there's a, right. yeah. so many different groups of people that have enriched my life and I'm forever thankful and blessed for that. Yeah, absolutely. Right. You also, this contribute for us to be more open-minded and open uh, to, to different relations and to different uh, friendships. So actually, I, I, uh, Dr. Craig, I enjoyed your conversation, actually. And I, I know that the, we are near to 40 minutes uh, or limitation, but I have to ask most difficult uh, question. Uh, okay. So I should prepare you. And you, you by definition, you, you have to have a, a clear answer. Okay. When are you going to visit Albania? Whenever I'm invited. Uh, I think that's the best, that's the best way to put it. Uh, you, yeah. you have an open invitation. You just, you win it. So I would love it. Uh, once yeah. things, you know, once things settle down and, and we, we are back you, you to. Follow, you, you want you to, 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 because we learned that we are neighbors. So your uh, Italian yep. identity and uh, Albanian identity, we are neighbors. So we have to get more engaged in the future, I think. It would really be a pleasure and a privilege to to meet everyone in Albania. I've never been. Uh, I would absolutely love that. So, inshallah, God willing, it inshallah. will happen. Inshallah. inshallah. Thank you. Thank, <laughs> thank you very you. much thank for you. your participation and uh, God bless you and uh, stay safe. God bless you too, Skander. Take, take care. Take care, Master. And dear friends, thank you very much for your participation. I hope we'll see you next uh, uh, coming events. Thank you very much. Master.